Mr. Farr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have an amendment number one at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Farr. Page two, line 12, increase the dollar amount by $8,314,766. Page three, line 10, increase the dollar amount by... Waive the reading, please. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Gentlemen, recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise with this very simple and I, I hope very partisan, bipartisan, non-controversial amendment because it's about our staff. We just passed uh, the, the uh, defense appropriation for $550 billion. And in that, we gave our troops a 2.1% pay raise. The president has asked uh, for federal employees to get a 1.5% pay raise, in a COLA increase. This amendment would allow uh, us to uh, meet that 1.5% by increasing our budgets, about $19,000 in office, uh, for, as the amendment pointed out, $8.3 million total. Um, now, it's not just, I mean, we haven't done this for a long time. In fact, if you go back through history, in 2010, our MRA account took a 5.5% uh, hit. 2011 and 2012, we took a 6.4% cut. 2012 and 2013, we cut ourselves 8.2%. So this uh, MRA has been flat funded uh, over and over again uh, at level years. This is the legislative branch of government. We're supposed to be as capable in, in particularly in this budget, and why I like being on this, on this subcommittee is because it really is the foundation for all of the support services in Congress, including the Capitol Police. And you really get into um, how well we fund it, how well we care for it, and then we ignore our own staff. And we've been doing this over and over and over. And in fact, outside groups that look at this have commented on it. The Congressional Management Foundation has said that we are underfunding our staff. The Congressional Research Service has shown it. A group, of a group known as Demand Progress has pointed out. And the leading think tank executives from Brookings, AEI, the New American Foundation, the R Street Institute, and the Campaign for Legal Center, the Legal Center has all pointed out that we are shortchanging our staffs. So what this amendment does is allow us uh, to keep our staff because what we find is the turnover is incredibly um, high. The average job on the Hill now is uh, three years or less. And when they ask people why they're leaving, they're saying for better work and better conditions. So um, the CRS studies have shown that over the last five years, the top 12 staff positions, every single one of them has lost value in their pay skill, some by as much as 21%. The same is true as if you take the study back 10 years, all top 12 positions lost value in pay scale. You have to go back 14 years to 2001 before you find a staff position whose salary actually increased in value. In that same period, federal employees increased their value by 6.4%. Today, our chiefs of staff are working at 12.9% less than they were five years ago. Our LAs are working at 11.8% less, and our caseworkers, the ones who go on the front line with our constituents back home, are working at 3.7% less than they were five years ago. Few people come to Congress expecting to be highly paid. Yet over time, it appears that the d difference between current pay levels and those available in other sectors are the determining factor that contribute to employee turnover. So this amendment would correct that. Um, and I, th I think it's, uh, it's not a lot of money, uh, and it, it's offset uh, in the off office of the architect. So let's try to bring back some professionalism in our office where we recognize our staff as much as we are recognizing the, the role of the military for the U.S. government, the role of all federal uh, other employees, and particularly our Capitol Police that surround us. Let's at least give our employees 
the raise that they have long deserved by passing this amendment. Chairman Graves. First, let me just thank uh, Congressman Farr for his commitment. This is a debate we, we've discussed and, and had in, in subcommittee, and his, uh, uh, as you've heard, his heartfelt um, thoughts towards our constituent services and how we provide that best, and I want to thank him for that. He's been a tremendous advocate for uh, staff here on the Hill and those that work in our offices and beyond, and, uh, and done a tremendous job, and he'll always be known for that. Um, we do have some, some fiscal challenges and constraints that we're trying to operate within, and I know that uh, he, he did some great research to try to find an offset, but as a committee, we've really, really uh, deeply looked at all the various components that make this bill, and it's really hard to find those extra dollars uh, at this moment. I will point out, though, that uh, the leadership uh, recently, as you probably are aware, found uh, a 1 percent increase or allocated a 1 percent increase to all MRAs from unspent MRA funds from the previous year. So that's a good step forward in the right direction. We want to continue that conversation moving forward and, uh, and, and try to find some ways that we can provide additional resources. But this time, I'd have to oppose the gentleman's amendment, not because of the gentleman himself, but just because the constraints were within. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I support my friend Sam Farr's amendment. I think that uh, when you look at what our role is in Congress, we have the legislative role, and then we have the service role. We support our constituents, and we do it well. And if we don't, we probably won't be here. Uh, our, anyone who has been in management and business will tell you, you're only as good as your team. And I think the same thing with all of our congressional staff. You're only as good as your team. And I think it's really unwise for us not to look after our staff. <laughs> Politically, we're not taking a raise, so we're not going to get hit on this. In fact, our constituents who have been serviced uh, by our staff who are overworked all the time. And if we don't deal with this issue, it's wise, it's the right thing to do, and it's something that will make us better. Because if we don't, we keep losing staff. We have less people who have experience, who know what to do, how to service our constituents. So I would hope that we could consider this as a fiscal responsibility issue, you know, taking care of your team. We're not talking about just a raise. We're talking about the body itself and making us strong. And when you represent over 700,000 people and you're not going to take care of your staff, I think that's unwise management. So I'd really incur, I, I would really ask that we can reconsider uh, uh, your amendment or consider your amendment and, and that the majority reconsider this very important issue. I think this has to do with the core of what we do in Congress. I yield back. Ms. Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of Mr. Farr's amendment. The Farr amendment seeks to add $8.3 million, a 1.5 percent increase to our members' representational al allowance. All, all members should be sympathetic to the Farr amendment, and I would venture to guess that the majority of us were prepared for this very hearing <coughs> by our uh, intrepid staff, um, arguably who have suffered the most from the, the cuts that we have endured. It is in both parties' interests to ensure that the House functions at the highest levels so we can attract and retain the best and brightest talent. We must leave this institution better than we found it. That's our responsibility on this full committee. With this in mind, it's important to note that we've provided the Capitol Police, for example, with 13 percent budget increases over the past two years, but have provided the House with a zero percent increase over the same period. In 2013, legislative assistants were being paid $6,000 less than they were in 2009 when adjusted for inflation. And I can only imagine how much worse these numbers are three years later. In case we've forgotten how difficult it is to survive when you're just starting out, because almost no one here is just starting out, so we're well past that, let me take you down uh, uh, for a walk down memory lane. A median-priced one-bedroom in the D.C. area costs $2,000 per month. You add first, last, and security, and after paying for rent and eating in the house cafeterias, which is no cheap effort either, we're lucky we can keep anyone on staff. We cannot carry out our constitutional duties with such a misguided sense of priorities. So, Mr. Chairman, I support the Farr Amendment. We kind of have to stop the madness here. I know that it is, you know, politically safe to not give our own office budgets an increase, but we have now recovered economically. With 74 straight months of job growth, we have come out of the Great Recession, and it is time to make sure that we're able to have budgets in our congressional offices that meet the needs of our constituents we de and that support our staff and ensure that they can be paid a wage that is competitive. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise to support Mr. Farr's amendment. Um, when you look at it, there's been a 20% decrease in MRA over our last five years. That's an average of $300,000. Steadily, steadily declining and pres presently frozen MRAs have negative impacts on our ability to do our jobs. Just last week, it was reported that the average length of service on Capitol, here for, Capitol Hill for a staffer is two years. So right, basically, when they learn their job, they leave for a better job. The average member's district has seen its population increase by 31,000, almost 32,000 people. That's 31,000 new constituents per member spread over a smaller staff. Uh, furthermore, since Obama took office in 2009 through 2014, his administration has issued roughly 150,000 pages of new rules enacted by this White House. That's more paperwork, more regulations, and more staff work by our teams to deal with a bigger and more complicated government. There is certainly a correlation between declining MRAs, staff number, and staff tenure, and providing our positive results to our constituents. Now, the offset here comes from the architect of the Capitol's capital construction and operations account. And cutting funds from one agency to give to another agency isn't ideal. And I understand this might slow some projects down, such as the Cannon renovation by a year or so. However, I don't see the point in renovating our offices when we can't even afford to keep them properly staffed. Uh, we need to incentivize staff to stay longer and work harder so that we can best serve the people who sent us up here. Therefore, I encourage my colleagues to support Mr. Farr's amendment. And by the way, the Senate nor this president has cut their budgets in the past five years. I yield back. Mr. Serrano. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I wish I could tell you that when I walk down the hallways here or when I'm in my district, people stop me and say, you know, Congressman Serrano, you're the greatest congressman in the history of this country. But usually what I hear is, you know, I went to your office and they were wonderful. Where were you? I said, I was in Washington. I said, oh, that's okay. They were great. And here I hear, you know, I met with so-and-so in your office and they told me straight what they could do, what they couldn't do. You know what I'm talking about because this is probably one of the few issues where we all have the same experience. The people who work for us are for the most part people who are very young. If, if America knew, and I've often wondered about this, how young the people who run this country are, and I'm not talking about us, you know, they would have new hope as to what is happening in, in, in our country because these young people, when they leave, they don't leave because they don't like their jobs. They don't leave because they don't want to help their country. They don't leave because they don't like working for an appropriator. That's a, that's a big privilege. They leave because someone is dangling a job, paying two, three times. We're not going to compete with that. But not to give them a small raise every year. OK, do we deserve a raise? Well, when you have 27 millionaires call the Yankees in your district, I'll, I'll argue that I deserve a raise, but forget about that. I'm having a better year than they are. Um, <laughs> so we've decided we're not giving ourselves a raise. That's fine. But our staffs are different. Our staffs are an example. They're a representation of us. And we're all proud of them. And as I look across at all of you, you want to shake your heads in, in, you know, in agreement, but there are political considerations. But I wish we can break them the way the gentleman just did and say, I will vote for the FAR Amendment. Because in doing so, we're showing respect for the people who serve the people who send us here. There can't be a better combination. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. Um, just would like to say that, obviously, service and how we can service our constituents, and I commend the gentleman from Mississippi for standing up and, and advocating for this amendment because I've been here 14 years and I've seen a real erosion of our ability to service our constituents. And just in my office alone, I think we've seen three or four staffers that we've had to, as they moved on, we never replaced. And the real concern I have here, having come a few years back, not nearly as long as some of you have been here, but to see the Dave Obies and the Jack Murthas and the chairmans of the world um, 
be here and really maintain and retain a lot of the institutional knowledge uh, that we had in this institution and that we've lost in this institution. And they were always accompanied by staff members who had been here almost as long as they had. Chairs of the committee, subcommittee chairs, but also a staff in the, in the offices. And I think we're getting close as the world's getting more complicated as we just went through with the defense bill. The complexities of the world, our intelligence apparatus, our security apparatus, education, entitlements, and all the rest. If we don't start maintaining, uh, not, not that we don't have great staff now, but the incentives to leave are so great and the pressures to leave are so great and we're never gonna pay what the private sector pays but we need to start thinking about more than just the next election, not just for ourselves, but for this institution. And if we don't start in this committee, I think protecting the integrity of this committee and this institution, that we're gonna continue to get run roughshod by the executive branch um, because they're gonna be able to bring people in and, and have a level of power that we forgot about. And, and I watched you may not have liked it, but I watched Dave Obie and Jack Murtha uh, and, and others who ran this committee, both Democrats and Republicans, who them and their staffers knew more than the bureaucrats knew uh, in the executive branch, knew more than others knew in agencies, and were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them because of the knowledge they had about the, the institution and how investments were made and decisions were made on the Hill. So I'm supporting this amendment because I think it's important for us to take a stand as the as appropriators to say that, that the Congress is important, Article One is important, what we stand for is important, and, and we're Article One, the Congress is, and we've got to start treating our staff with respect and the kind of appreciation that, that they deserve. And so I rise in support of this amendment and I hope we see it in a bigger context not just the constituent services, which are so important, while budgets have gone down, constituent numbers have gone up for many of us, and we're still trying to service uh, our constituents on the ground. But think about this institution and what we need to do to drive democracy in the legislative process here in our own, uh, our own country. Mr. Israel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise to uh, very strongly support this amendment. Uh, two weeks ago in my district uh, on Long Island in New York, I attended uh, an event to uh, provide over, long overdue recognition to uh, Vietnam War veterans. Uh, the uh, Northport VA Hospital expected 250 Vietnam veterans to show up. 1,500 showed up. And I went through what I know that all of my colleagues on this uh, committee enjoy. And that is a steady stream of people approaching and saying, Congressman, uh, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm neither but your office got me an, a uh, retroactive payment. Your office got me a medal that I'd been denied for decades. When I called your office, they dropped everything and they took care of me. And I may agree with you, Mr. Israel, I may disagree, or as we say on Long Island, I may agree with you, Mr. Israel, I may disagree with you, Mr. Israel, but your office showed me what your priorities are and that you take care of us. Now. I didn't make the calls to the VA. I didn't process the paperwork or the files. My casework staff did that. My veterans casework staff did that. They were, or everybody on staff is valuable, everybody, including the people here who, at the very last minute, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, made that manager's amendment a little warmer. <laughs> they all work hard. For me, the people in my district office, uh, who work hard every single day without regard to politics or policy, but just making sure that the people I represent are taken care of, they deserve some incentives. I want to keep them doing their job they're doing. I want to keep them dedicated. And the way to do that is to give them what uh, so many other people uh, get uh, in, in politics and in the private sector, uh, the recognition that they deserve uh, and uh, additional compensation. Uh, so on behalf of those people, I, I very strongly support this amendment. Judge Carter. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of Mr. Farr's amendment. You know, I've, I've got Fort Hood in my district. 
We range from 52,000 soldiers to right now around 39,000 soldiers. In the United States Army, almost every soldier in the heavy army passes through Fort Hood at some time or the other. And when they pass through Fort Hood, they, they learn a wonderful thing. Texas does not have an income tax. So those soldiers decide that the best place to claim as their post of residence is clean Texas. And they all claim clean Texas as their residence. There are literally tens of thousands of active duty troops in this country today who claim Fort Hood as their re residence so that they don't have to pay income tax. So when they come to the Pentagon, they don't pay Virginia income tax because they li they're residents of Texas. We're proud to have them. But in turn, the people who do constituent services from my office have tens of thousands more constituents than other posts in the United States. It's peculiar to my district. We are aware of it. Yet I will repeat what Mr. Israel just said. The greatest compliment I get from day one until today is that my office took care of the business that helped a soldier or helped an individual in our district, and they deserve to be recognized for that. So I joined the, my colleague, Mr. Farr, in this. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I uh, also rise in support of this amendment and com commend my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Farr, for offering it. Um, we're hearing lots of stories here this morning about ways that uh, our staff have um, extended our reach. Our staff have been uh, dedicated in their service to constituents, doing things that we as individual members could, uh, could never do for ourselves. I just make a couple of additional points. One is that uh, our staffs and the excellence of our staffs is a defining characteristic of, of this Congress. We, uh, in the House Democracy Partnership, uh, work with parliaments all over the world. And uh, one of the first things we find, and the, one of the first things we uh, try to promote, is that uh, staff makes a critical, yeah. critical difference as to the quality of a parliamentary institution, the quality of the work they do, uh, our ability to have an independent uh, source of information, to stand up to the lobbyists, to the bureaucrats, to whoever else has staying power around Washington, the staying power that we have, the credibility we have, depends very, very heavily on the kind of staff we're able to employ. Second point, we all know that we're not going to, in the end, compete in every instance successfully with uh, the private sector. We're, uh, that's, that's not what this is about. But I think it is about being able to retain our staff and, and keep them on board for a reasonable period of time. We all have very young staffs. I expect every one of us depends on a kind of middle-level staff uh, individuals to, to mentor the others. There's simply no other way to bring our staffs uh, along. And if people are just in and out of here and we don't have that staying power, that ability to mentor, to bring younger staff along, then the whole uh, staff enterprise isn't going to work. Well, we, we depend on this. It, it's the right thing to do, but it's also, I think, the smart thing to do to get the staff salaries where they need to be to have reasonable tenures here on Capitol Hill and to uh, have the dynamic within our offices where younger people get brought along effectively. Thank you. There being no further debate, the question, uh, Mr. Farr is recognized close. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, think about this, your own staff's rent increase. The amount of money that your office will get will not even cover that. In all due respect to Mr. Graves saying we can't afford it, the architect's budget has $560 million in it. We're just offsetting $8 million. We can't afford this. The real question is, can we afford not to do this? Because we're going to be losing this institutional's, institution's memory so important for us to do our business well. So I think all of us ought to think about this. This is one thing we can do to help retain our staffs, at least to help them pay part of their annual rent increase. Thank you very much.
Time has expired. The question is on the far amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. <laughs> the is agreed to. Are there